listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host is once again Michelle Jewell Shaw, Lighthouse volunteer, teacher, photographer, and mom. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. This is episode 81 of Lighthearted, slated to be released on September 21st, 2020. On this date in 1780, Benedict Arnold gave the British the plans for West Point. And on this date in 1938, the most destructive hurricane in New England history made landfall. The Great Hurricane of 1938 killed around 700 people, including seven people at lighthouses on New England's south-facing coast. In New Bedford, Massachusetts, the wife of keeper Arthur Small was killed when the storm surge swept over Palmer's Island Light Station. After tremendous damage around New Bedford in the 1938 hurricane, and again in the 1954 hurricane, a massive hurricane protection barrier was built at the entrance to the harbors of New Bedford and Fairhaven. The barrier is 4,500 feet long and about 20 feet high with a 150 foot wide gated opening to allow vessels to pass through. You can actually walk on top of the barrier and at low tide you can walk from the barrier onto Palmer's Island where the 1849 lighthouse tower now stands alone. So where are we going today, Jeremy? Today, we are going to the island of Nantucket, south of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. We're going to be talking about Sankety Head Lighthouse on the southeastern corner of the island. Our guest, Rob Benchley, is mostly known for his photography, but he's also very involved with the lighthouse. Michelle, please help me tell our listeners about Sankety Head Lighthouse and Rob Benchley. Sure, Jeremy. Nantucket, an island of about 105 square miles, located some 30 miles south of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, today is a popular tourist destination and summer colony. From the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s, Nantucket was the world's leading whaling port. A lighthouse was established at Brant Point at the entrance to the island's main harbor in 1746, and then another at Great Point Nantucket's northernmost extremity in 1784. But the island's east and south coasts remained devoid of lighthouses well into the 19th century, in spite of the high volume of shipping traffic passing the island and the presence of dangerous shoals offshore. In his important report to Congress of 1843, the engineer I.W.P. Lewis wrote, and I quote, there is a fatal spot upon the coast of Massachusetts where many a brave heart and many a gallant ship lie buried in one common grave. The shoals of Nantucket are known and dreaded by every navigator on the Atlantic seaboard. The establishment of a lighthouse at Sias Consent would be more generally useful to the commerce of the United States than any other position on the seaboard." End quote. A bluff at Sankety Head was chosen as the lighthouse site. The name Sankety is said to come from a Wampanoag Indian word for a highland. Local tradition informs us that the bluffs, nearly 100 feet high, were used as a lookout for whales by some of the early European settlers who went after whales close to shore before advancing to longer expeditions. A 53-foot tall brick lighthouse was built at Sankety Head, beginning service on February 1st, 1850. The installation of a second order Fresnel lens made Sankety Head the first Massachusetts lighthouse with a Fresnel lens and the first lighthouse in the United States with a Fresnel lens as part of its original equipment. As Nantucket evolved from whaling capital to vacation resort, the lighthouse became a popular attraction, with many people climbing to its lantern to enjoy the view and its magnificent lens. The light was converted to electric operation in 1933, and the Fresnel lens was replaced by a modern rotating aero beacon type light in 1950. The old lens can be seen at the Nantucket Whaling Museum. In 1953, the station's old keeper's house was demolished and replaced by a modern ranch house. The station was automated and de-staffed in 1965. When the Coast Guard removed the lantern in 1969, complaints about the tower's appearance led to the creation of a new aluminum lantern. 
In 1990, the Army Corps of Engineers estimated that Sankety Headlight would be in danger of falling over the eroding bluff within 10 years. The Coast Guard housing and other buildings were eventually moved back from the eroding bluff, leaving the lighthouse standing alone. In the fall of 2005, the Sconset Trust announced that it was working with the Nantucket Historical Association to gain ownership of the lighthouse with the goal of having it relocated to safer ground. Preparations for the historic move began in September 2007, and ownership was transferred to the Sconset Trust in the following month. The move was completed in the fall 2007, and the lighthouse was relighted in its new location by the end of November. The new location is next to the fifth hole of the Sankety Head Golf Course, 390 feet to the northwest and 250 feet from the bluff's edge. The Sconset Trust is responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of the lighthouse and its grounds. Rob Benchley is now the modern day keeper of Sankety Head Lighthouse. Rob is an accomplished photojournalist who has been the staff photographer for three island newspapers, and his photography has also been featured in the New York Times and the Boston Globe. His books include Scallop Season, a Nantucket Chronicle, co-written with Jim Patrick, Sconset, co-written with Richard Trust, and Keeping the Light, about the historic move of Sankety Head Lighthouse in 2007. Rob and his wife, Carol, a retired Nantucket school teacher, live in a house they built together in Sconset with a view of Sankety Head Lighthouse. I spoke with Rob via Zoom in August. Let's listen to that conversation now. I am speaking with Rob Benchley on Nantucket today. And uh, I really, really appreciate you being with me, Rob. We first met uh, a number of years ago on the island. It's good to see you today. Yeah, thanks. It's, ni it's nice to see you. Uh, yeah, that was a number of years ago. It was, finally, it was finally great to meet you after seeing your work after all these years. You've been a busy guy with lighthouses. Well, <laughs> so, so have you. Before we get into talking about lighthouses, that's mainly what I want to talk about today. But if you don't mind, I'd just like to talk a little bit about your background, your family background. First of all, I'm, I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with your famous grandfather, the great Robert, humorist yeah. and actor, Robert Benchley. Uh, besides being a, a famous writer and humorist, he acted in many movies in the 30s and 40s. He was all, it was always fun to see him. I think he died before you were born. Is that correct? Yes, indeed, he did. He died in 1945 and, um, or 46, maybe. Uh, my father always said that he had to, he had the bad taste to die before I was born. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that's quite a legacy besides him. The author Nathaniel Benchley was an uncle. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, Robert and Gertrude had two sons, uh, Robert Jr. and Nathaniel. And Nathaniel was a, a writer who uh, thinly disguised Nantucket or specifically Sias Gonset in his, a lot of his novels and he went on to write uh, children's books, and he was very prolific. Yeah, and Peter Benchley, who wrote Jaws, is, right. was a, a cousin, is that right? Yes, Nathaniel's uh, oldest son, Peter, wrote Jaws as a kind of a writing project, is how that started, and, <laughs> and look where it got him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Made him a couple of bucks. Couple. Yeah, so you are in a great tradition there, and you're, you're carrying on as a, as a photojournalist. And you, you've been a photojournalist on Nantucket for quite a few years, but you grew up in New York City, and I'm wondering what took you to Nantucket? Well, I was born in New York City, and that was probably the, well, it's not the last time I was there, but um, grew up in, in Connecticut, and my family, both on my mother's side and my father's side, even before they were married, had come to Nantucket in the summers back as far as, oh, the 20s, I would say, maybe even a little bit earlier. And so my introduction to the island was through my parents and grandparents. And um, I eventually moved here in 1982, I'm going to say. Uh, I, came, I came here for one year for a job at the local newspaper, the Inquirer and Mirror. I just didn't quite get away. So <laughs> I'm not still working for that newspaper, but uh, I'm still doing a lot of photography and I worked with two other newspapers since then. Both of them are defunct at the moment. One was the Nantucket Beacon, and it was a, a weekly, and then that, that went under, and then the Nantucket Independent, and that went under too. So, um, so it's been, you know, 
35 years or more of journalism here and it's it's entertaining and kind of wonderful it's 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 almost unique <laughs> well, Nantucket's definitely unique and the uh, part of Nantucket where you live is very unique too uh, so back in March 1984 Great Point Lighthouse at the northern tip of Nantucket was destroyed in a storm the uh, the old tower was destroyed and you were one of the first people to get there to photograph the ruins after the storm and I wonder if you can describe uh, that experience sure yeah uh, that was quite a storm it was one of those typical three-day nor'easters that New England gets and um, Great Point Lighthouse had been pretty close to the edge of the beach for some time and this storm just took it out and it totally collapsed and so myself and a couple of reporters from the Inquirer Mirror and the Boston Globe, uh, they came down and we, we borrowed somebody's Wagoneer Jeep. And the only time the tide was right to cross over the sand spit that had been washed away was like 5.30 in the morning that particular week. So we were up in Adam about 3.30 and we drove out to an area, what's called the Galls, and it's a a low spit of sand that always gets washed over in big storms. But this time it was chest deep when we got there and we waited for the tide to come down a little bit. And we waded across probably a couple of hundred yards of uh, barrier beach that was submerged. And it was probably pretty stupid, um, <laughs> but we did make it across and we got a bunch of photographs and we couldn't be there very long because once the tide goes out, you know, it has a tendency to come back in and, uh, so I think we were only there about 35 minutes. But when we, I have to admit that when we got over there, there were footprints in the sand. Somebody had beat us there. One, one set of footprints. I think we did find out that it was somebody we knew, but we took the claim of being there first, knowing that somebody else really was there first. So we got our photographs and uh, always with the nervousness of knowing that we could get stranded out there for a whole nother tide cycle. So we went back and did just fine, but the next day, uh, uh, Stan Grossfeld's photographs were on the front page of the Boston Globe, and the following week, obviously, the Inquirer Mirror ran a full story and photographs, uh, aerials, too. It was, a, it was a big deal here. It was um, well-received, and we all made it s safely. I wrote a little thing um, about that adventure, and my final line was, um, if, if my... If my mother had been here, she would have spanked me. <laughs> well, anyway, we, we made it fine. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, quite an adventure. And just uh, for our listeners who, who don't know, the uh, Great Point Lighthouse was rebuilt not too long after the old tower was destroyed. And that's one of the few cases in the country where a traditional looking lighthouse uh, has been built in relatively recent years. And uh, it's standing proud today. And it's... Uh, made of uh, materials that are, are, it's not likely to fall over anytime soon, I think, like the old one did. Yeah, that's, that's correct. One of our local contractors, Augie Ramos, did a lot of the work and they poured a solid concrete cone substructure, beautiful tapered, wonderful thing. It was all engineered and with a very, very deep foundation. And then uh, they spent a few weeks with actual granite block to put the veneer on and it's real thick one foot thick granite blocks a lot of the old granite was used in putting up the new the newer tower mm -hmm. and um, it, it was quite a project and beautifully done and now it's got a yes. solar, solar panel on it and flashing away Yep, I've been in it a couple of times and it really did a great job. So you've been living in the village of Syasconset or Sconset as it's usually known on Nantucket for quite a few years as we talked about since around 1982. And that is where Sconset is where Sankety Head Lighthouse is located. Uh, it was a whaling and fishing village, later an actor's colony. And uh, I've been there a number of times over the years. I know Sconset feels different from the rest of the island. Uh, what do you think it is about Sconset that makes it special? I think what makes Sconset special is uh, it's remote. You know, it, it really, it, it's, it's on a, the elbow, the eastern elbow of the island, and um, the air is a little different. The wind's always blowing, and I think people-wise, it was always sort of a, it was an outlier to the town, and 
people were drawn to it for its wildness, except it's also sometimes quite civilized. There were all kinds of things going on out here. So I think it's the air. You, know, you don't have to go very far outside of the village to be in total wildness. And you're right on the edge of, of a kind of a natural potential for chaos. I don't think that's, that's ever spoken, but I, I, I think that is so much in the air. You know, it's so pretty and lovely and everything, but there's Mother Nature. Eating just away at it. Just, the, just around the corner, eating away at it. And yeah. So let's talk about Sanctity Head Lighthouse. What do you think Sanctity Head Lighthouse means to Sconset and to Nantucket as a whole? I think Sanctity means a lot to the people of Nantucket and also people of Sconset because it, it, there are a lot of firsts there. People like to have, you know, it was the, it was the first Fresnel lens in the U.S. Well, actually, it was the second, but uh, lots of firsts, and um, it's on a high bluff overlooking the ocean, part of that wildness I was talking about earlier, and uh, reasonably old, uh, built in 1849 and lit first in uh, 1850, and really probably saved thousands of lives by its very existence, as many lighthouses have done over the years. And it's a, it's a, it's a local icon. And you can see Sankety Light from almost anywhere on the island if you're pretty much high enough. Uh, you can always see it from any approach by water. And it's a, it's a nice, safe beacon that you can see and find. And it's welcoming. And people, when they're on the land, they go up there and they walk around. And you can see people hugging the lighthouse. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty special. Just uh, another note on the Fresnel lens. I believe Sankety was the first lighthouse in the U.S. to be built with a Fresnel lens as part of its uh, original equipment. So right, yes. Yeah. yeah, never yeah. had an, any other light before that. Correct, yes, as part of the, the original equipment. And um, the engineer, who was Benjamin Franklin Isherwood, who was a very young man at the time, he went on to be the chief engineer for the Union in the 1860s and uh, that poor guy had to go all the way to France to talk with a manufacturer of that fr Fresnel lens. It, it must have been a wonderful junket in those days. But yeah. he, came back, he came back with the goods. So you co-wrote and uh, did a lot of the photography for a beautiful book in 2009, Keeping the Light, which was about the move of Sankety Head Lighthouse back from the edge of that rapidly eroding bluff. I have the book right next to me here. It's really, really a beautiful book. Uh, before the move, were you monitoring the erosion of the bluff very closely yourself? Yeah, the erosion was, for me anyway, and people in Sconset became really obvious in the, in the 1970s. And it increased each year. And it just seemed like every year there was another area that slumped into the ocean. And uh, I'm going to say in the early 1980s, people started saying we've got to figure out something and working with the Coast Guard and local landowners and everything. And really, nobody really knew what to do. They just knew they had to do something. And the, the thought of moving it, I think, was lowest on the list in some of the literature I've looked at. Trying to armor the beach was first at top. And, um, and it became clear that as the, another decade and a half went by that moving was going to be the only option. Yeah. And I think time of the move. Uh, well, originally, Sankety was built 250 feet back from the edge of the top of the bluff. And when they finally moved it, it was about 70 feet. Much and, more, and it would have been too late. And it would have been too late, right. So what is the Sconset Trust? Well, the Sconset Trust is a, primarily was a, a land preservation organization. And it started, in, I think it was 1984. And when development was kind of eating up a lot of places and it, and it really wasn't I don't think the Wisconsin Trust was born out of anger or anything it was just that okay we've got to we got to keep an eye on this and where do we want to develop and where do we not want to and so they've started as a, a land trust and with uh, private donations they were able to pick up a parcel here and there and it worked well because you know there, there's the conservation the Nantucket Conservation Foundation which is island-wide they're primarily concerned with larger tracts of open space. And um, they, they love the idea of the Sconset Trust because it, it was a local effort and local 
pieces that were dear to the hearts of people who lived in Sconset. And it's been really good for the village. And um, so they, they also, they moved into historic preservation. They started encouraging people to put um, restrictions on the architectural restrictions on their houses. Then the sanctity problem was a big elephant in the room. And I think they just decided that they had the, the intent and the desire to take it on. So, and they did. They had a big role in the moving of the lighthouse. Yeah, they did. They, once they had a plan and a company who was interested in moving it and a commitment from the Coast Guard and the area residents and the voters, they, they went ahead and they did some major fundraising over a couple of years. And it may not have even been that long. It was pretty brief and they raised a lot of money and, and the whole island, it seemed, came out to help out and make donations and then watch the whole move. It was this beehive of activity for a few weeks in the fall of 2007. And I don't know, for, for, for my thinking, it just worked out so well. I can't imagine it working any other way. So besides documenting the move of the lighthouse in 2007 as a photojournalist, did you have a, a role in the process besides that? I was involved primarily as uh, to document this. And um, actually, it, it worked well because um, I was sort of between newspapers. So uh, uh, I had the time to do it. So I jumped right in and I was up there every day. And the company that actually did the moving said to me, you know, you're, you're welcome to be anywhere, go anywhere, do anything. Just always wear your hard hat and stay out of our way. I, that's exactly what I did. So, it, I mean, the access to the whole project was quite awesome. Normally, you know, as a working for newspapers and magazines, press people aren't always allowed around. And I was able to get right up close and it, it couldn't have been more, it, it was just ideal. And I don't think, I, I, th I think the photography part of it was, of course, to, for PR purposes for the trust and everything. And then about three weeks into the preparations for it, we figured out, okay, we will do a book on this. Yeah, so. and there's a lot of great pictures of the move process in the, in the book. And again, I'll mention keeping the light. And that's, people can still, well, people can still buy copies of that, right? The Sconset Trust has uh, copies and also, um, two of the Nantucket bookstores, uh, Mitchell's Book Corner and um, Bookworks, they both carry it. And it's also, you can also get it through the, the Sconset Trust website. Mm -hmm. Okay, that'd be a good way for people to get it to benefit yes. the, the Sconset Trust uh, by buying Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of touched on this a, a few minutes ago, but what was it like when the move was completed? It must have been really emotional for everybody involved. It took so much to get to that point. Yeah, it, it was um, on, that, on that last day that it was finally in its new home, there was a great big sigh across Nantucket, I think, because, um, you know, it, it was in its new place and it was, it was going to be good for another few decades anyway, uh, maybe 10 decades. We don't know. Nobody knows. And uh, it was a very uh, sunny, bright day and they got to the last half an inch and then the last quarter of an inch and then the last eighth of an inch and they went okay stop and everybody yay it was a great a great cry went up and then later in the day one of our local pilots uh flew his biplane over the over the lighthouse with the with his smoke streamers and around it he did a couple of loops around the lighthouse and of course that made it to the cover of the book but that that was i mean the move was over and then there was a lot of grunt work of uh, real landscaping and and shoring up the foundation and stripping the old paint and doing the grounds that 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 took another eight months I would say and then they had a grand a grand reopening the following July I believe with lots of fanfare and it was just great yeah jumping ahead here uh, you are now the modern day keeper of Sanctity yeah. End Lighthouse and how did that come about <laughs> Yes, uh, the uh, which I dryly called the the civilian keeper. I th that's the title I use when I have to write letters to the U.S. Coast Guard, who they maintain the actual beacon itself, right. and the Sconset Trust does everything else. And um, uh, 
my wife and I live here in Sconset year round. So we're here and uh, the Sconset Trust just needed someone to sort of look at, look after it. And, and as a result of being there when it was moved, I'm, I'm uh, friends and cohorts with the guy, with the engineering company that actually did the move. So there's a lot of contact. So I'm here year round and I've got everybody's phone numbers and it just kind of made sense. And I, I tell you what, it was a little boy's fantasy come true. <laughs> and they gave me that key. It was this, it, it, it glowed in my hand. I said, oh, <laughs> it's like the ring I, in Lord of the Rings or something. It was the ring. Exactly. And my, my, my duties are, are varied. Uh, they aren't prescribed or proscribed as, as things come up. Uh, but we have visitors to, to the lighthouse and there are open houses now and again. So I open it up and make sure it's clean and swept. And we, our last open house, I actually had to take out the trash that entertained everybody waiting in line. Um, and, but also just, you know, keep an eye on it. And also uh, we're starting to put more exhibits as we have more and more people visiting the lighthouse. We put more interpretive exhibits on the inside, mostly, descriptive posters with timelines and photographs and posters and things and uh, just to make it easier for the visitor. So it's, it's very exciting and, and, and really I've only been the keeper for about a year and a half and uh, we have all kinds of great ideas coming up and mostly to make everybody's experience there uh, more informative and have some fun and hopefully move into a place where we can have the lighthouse open much more frequently than it mm. is now. I know there have been occasional open houses uh, when the lighthouse has been open in the, in the past, but you're talking about on a much more regular basis, hopefully in the future. Uh, yes, as it has been for the last few years, uh, we have open, what we call open days. Father's Day in the spring is one of them. And then we were open for the Columbus Day weekend and uh, the Columbus Day weekend one open house coincides with the Nantucket Cranberry Bogs. They have an open house there through the Conservation Foundation. And so people will come to visit that and then they'll come up and see Sankety. And, you know, we can only take X amount of people, maybe six or seven at a time up to Spiral Stairway. So it, people always love it. And it's usually a really nice day. I think we've only been weathered out twice. So we're, so we're hoping to be able to open it on a more regular basis. And, and it's mostly uh, s staffing and because we're mostly volunteer. So at, at some point, we'll be able to open it up more frequently. We just need to come up with a plan that's, and, and safety is one of the biggest things because, you know, it's a big open spiral stairway and oh. it's quite a climb. And we have to become our kind of our own little Sconset Park Service for this and get really organized. So. Well, if you open a lighthouse, they will come. And I'm sure you'd get a, a lot of people. Even if you open the lighthouse every day, you'd get a lot of people every day. Yeah, for sure. And Nantucket yeah. is certainly a busy place in the summer. Maybe not quite as much this summer with the pandemic, but you're right. telling me it's still still pretty busy there. And that's, that's, that's good it to hear. Certainly busy this morning. So we, uh, we talked about your book, uh, Keeping the Light, uh, which is a, a record of the, the move of the lighthouse in 2007. There's also a, a lot of history in the book. It's really an excellent overview of the lighthouse. If we could just uh, talk a little bit more about that book uh, and how it, how it came together. Yes. Uh, putting a book of the photographs together evolved very quickly and, and, and rather naturally. And um, uh, the, we, we had kept a a, a daily photograph record on the Sconset Trust website of progress so that people who couldn't be there, especially if they were in Chicago or somewhere in California, they could check the day's progress. And so that, that became uh, almost hour by hour thing of documenting what was going on. And then I'd come home and I was showed this program where you can plug in the photographs. So, we already had a day-to-day -day look at it no matter what. And the next natural thing was to put them together in a book. So it was, we got some funding for the publishing of it. Uh, and uh, 
uh, Bob Felch, who at the time was the president of the Wisconsin Trust, he and I sat down one winter in my living room with a gateway computer and Photoshop, and we put this thing together, and we do a chapter at a time, and it was, well, we took over the living room in my house for, sure. for a, good, a good few months. Yeah. And, we had, uh, and we have a crack uh, graphic designer who we use for our brochures and everything. And so we just all worked together and it kind of created itself because each day was, was a new story and each, each uh, event along the way, like turning the light off and then turning the light back on, there was always something that was new and exciting. So basically, Bob Felcher and I just, I won't say we whipped it out. It took us a long time because we realized it had to be just so. And as I said, we had it published locally, and um, I think it was about a year late. Uh, <laughs> we, we well, were, uh, it was worth it. Yeah, yeah. The care and, and love you put into it is really, really apparent. Like I, I've said, uh, it's a, a really beautiful book, and I recommend people people get it if they have any interest at all in Sanctity Head Lighthouse or if they're just into lighthouses, period. So you've also co-written a, a couple of books on the village of Sconset, including an Images of America book. I imagine there's lots of historic images in that book. Yes, the, uh, the Images of America, that's an Arcadia publishing company. And, um, I, you know, you see them in all the bookstores. Uh, my favorite title was... Uh, the historic steam engines of Canton, Ohio. That was a nice <laughs> title. And they, so they yeah. do everything. Absolutely. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there again, it started as an idea uh, in Richard Trust's head. He's a retired uh, sports writer for the Patriot Ledger. And he'd been coming to Wisconsin for a long, long time and just decided this is going to be one of his retirement projects and called me up, asked me if I had any photographs of Sconset. And I said, well, I don't have many, but I'll be happy to help you find some. It was only a couple more months and I got myself, I, I got sucked right into it and even wrote some of it. So it's a, it's a, you know, 150 pages uh, pamphlet style, primarily historic photographs from the Nantucket Historical Association. They've got a terrific library and it's very accessible. Library of, they've got a terrific library of photographs and they're very accessible. It's a, it's a great organization to work with. And so we went about writing captions and part of the doing some of the design and an enormous amount of work. I have great respect now for the people that wrote the steam engines of Canton, Ohio, because it was a lot of work. And it, uh, one of the different things, kind of a departure from what Arcadia usually does is they'd let us do some modern interviews to sort of set up against the older photographs because Gonset's a living place that relies on its history and creates its own history by being what it is. And it was inescapable. So, so that was a different turn. Unfortunately, it, it was supposed to come out this summer. I believe that it, uh, it, it hasn't been printed yet because of the COVID-19 oh, okay. thing. And it's, it's 10 feet from the printing press right oh. now. They, they, they shut it down before the plates got put on the press. Oh, uh, no. yeah. I, I, one of my books is delayed indefinitely as well. So I, I know what that's all about. I actually did a book for Arcadia Publishing, one of the Images of America book a couple of years ago on wave swept lighthouses of New England. And so I know oh. how much work it is. But it, and it's also interesting to kind of fit a shoehorn everything into the template that they provide. Yes. But yeah. yeah, it's a challenge, but it was, it was a good experience. They were good to work with. So yes, they've, they've, they've been really great with us because uh, you know, computer problems and imaging problems and all the things that get in the way do. Um, but yes, you're right. That, that template is um, challenging. <coughs> so I have one more question for you for bonus points. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so get ready. All right. Why do you think it's important to preserve lighthouses in general? And in particular, why is it important to preserve Sankety Head Lighthouse? Well, I, I really believe that preserving lighthouses is uh, essential. It, 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 you know, it's painful to see them go into disrepair or get destroyed or abandoned because it, it's a, such an incredible connection, not only to the past, but it, lighthouses are emotional they make people feel things. They make people think of 
Yeah. Well, days gone by, but also they're a, they're a witness, they're a sentinel, and they appear to be everlasting. Although they're not, but I just think that they're, they're symbols of strength and longevity. And they've also saved thousands of lives. And I think that uh, that as a background is applicable to Sankety because of the history of Nantucket and the history of shipping and whaling and everything nautical. It sort of a, stands as a link between what's going on in the ocean and what's in people's hearts. And I think lighthouses just are in people's hearts. That's why the name of this podcast is Lighthearted. <laughs> so that's, that's beautifully oh, said, Rob. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah. I walked Thank right you. into that one. <laughs> yes, you did. That's why it's light space hearted. It doesn't mean right. humorous, okay. although sometimes it could be humorous, but uh, it means people right. who have lighthouses in their hearts, which I think is, is certainly most people. So that was really beautifully said. And Rob, it's been a, a great pleasure talking with you today. And I, it's been a few years since I've been on the island. I hope to get back in the not too distant future and uh, maybe get together with you when I'm, I'm there. So I really look forward to that. But again, yeah, thank that'd, you. Thank, yeah, that'd be that'd be terrific, and I can I can show you uh, some of our interpretive exhibits in there at the light. Hopefully, at that point, I'll still have a key. <laughs> <laughs> and glowing um, key. <laughs> the, right, the glowing key. Right, but no, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, and well, also, thank you. Th thanks so much for your uh, introduction and help with. Uh, with the Coast Guard and getting some of the information for the light that we're that we have now, I haven't gotten too much further on, but um, I have I've emailed spoken with the people at Sabic Marine who make the, uh, the 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 LED version of that one, and I'm just trying to pull information together so I can make a proposal to the Coast Guard. Uh, sure, you know it, it it may never happen, but but they seem to be really open to the idea. Idea of what? Do you want to clarify what we were talking about here? Oh yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Um, when they, you know, they installed the the old beacon that had been there for decades, finally burned out, and they replaced it with a with a uh, VRB25, you know, I believe. There, the rotating um, uh, acrylic light. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I th I think people were expecting the great big flash. You know, Sankey was right. called. The, it was called the Blazing Star when it first was turned on so many years ago. But um, so I've just been working with the Coast Guard and, and the manufacturer to see if we can get something that's a little bit stronger to get people's hearts pumping again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good luck with that. And if there's anything I can do, just uh, let me know. So again, thank you so much, Rob, for spending this <laughs> time with me today. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thanks. It's been my pleasure too. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll see you sometime and keep those lighthouses rotating. Earlier, we mentioned the second order Fresnel lens from Sankety Head Lighthouse is on display at the Nantucket Whaling Museum. The museum is a great place to learn about Nantucket's important historical role in the whaling industry. The Sankety Head lens sits on a large pedestal and the total height is about 16 feet. When the lens went into service, the Nantucket Enquirer reported, quote, the flashes of light are very brilliant and must be visible at a distance of 25 miles, unquote. There were other claims that the light could be seen at the unlikely distance of 40 miles. The historian Samuel Adams Drake later called its flashes very full, vivid, and striking, and reported that fishermen called the light the blazing star. As Nantucket evolved from whaling capital to vacation resort, the lighthouse became a popular attraction, with many people climbing to its lantern to enjoy the view and the magnificent lens. An accommodation was made to the styles of the period. The following notice appeared in the Nantucket Mirror of October 25th, 1856, and I quote, the narrow aperture on the platform under the lantern at Sankety Lighthouse has been widened to allow ladies with hoop skirts to pass through to see the reflectors, end quote. You can read more about the Nantucket Whaling Museum online at nha.org. And you can read more about the Sconset Trust at sconsettrust.org.
Thanks again to today's guest, Rob Benchley, and thanks as always to the volunteers, members, and staff of the United States Lighthouse Society and its chapters and affiliates. You can learn more about the many things the U.S. Lighthouse Society has to offer at uslhs.org. Don't forget to rate and review us if you listen using Apple Podcasts. We welcome your feedback. You can always email me at jeremy at uslhs.org. And as always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.